people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Yoga event is held here. Severe injustice and they should be stopped. We should raise our voices. Condemn this uh, brutal act. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's take a look at the headlines first. UNGA president calls on international community to redevelop efforts to eliminate global terrorism. Taliban obliterating Afghan women's rights. And Indian Army launches Operation Sarva Shakti to counter terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir. Terrorism today has spread across international borders, serving its sole purpose of disturbing peace and tranquility in the world. It has always destroyed the efforts of like-minded entities that relentlessly work to maintain peace across the globe. Recently, in a global address, Dennis Francis President of the United Nations General Assembly, highlighted the pervasive threat of terrorism, acknowledging India's status as a victim of this destabilizing force. His remarks underscore the urgent need for concerted international efforts to combat terrorism and preserve global peace. We have a report. In recent years, acts of terror have transcended borders, leaving communities shattered and instilling fears in the hearts of people from different corners of the world. And the world is grappling with the damaging and destabilizing effects of terrorism. Dennis Francis, the president of the 78th session of the United Nations General Assembly, called on member states to unite in combating this global menace. Ambassador Francis, while talking about global terrorism, also termed India as a victim of terrorism. For several years, India has been itself battling terrorism with great determination. Acknowledging India as a victim of terrorism, Francis stressed international cooperation and highlighted the UN's anti-terrorism program. Terrorism is a global phenomenon. It is everywhere. Radicalization exists in places uh, where you would think it does not exist. Its effect on society uh, is damaging and destabilizing. It's not acceptable. I'm aware that India has been a victim of terrorism. Many countries around the world have. The United Nations has a program of action on, on anti-terrorism, requires all countries, all countries, all member states, uh, to honor their commitments under that program and to work collaboratively through exchange of information and in other means to minimize the possibility of, uh, of terrorism. Dennis Francis has embarked on a five-day visit to India. During his visit, President Francis, along with India's permanent representative to UN, Ruchira Kamboch, laid wreath at the 2611 Memorial in Taj Hotel in Mumbai, commemorating the victims of the 2008 terrorist attacks. On November 26, 2008, India suffered one of the deadliest terror attacks in its history. The orchestrated attacks were executed by 10 lashkar e taiba terrorists who sailed from the Pakistani port city of Karachi to Mumbai. The horrific attack continued for over three days before the Indian forces took down nine of these terrorists. Among their ranks, Ajmal Kasab was the only one captured alive. 
He too, however, met his fate at the hands of justice four years after the incident. The 2611 attacks claimed 166 lives, including foreign nationals, while around 300 people were left injured. Recalling the tragic incident at a Mumbai hotel during the 2611 attacks, Francis called on the international community to redouble efforts to eliminate global terrorism. I remember well uh, the incident uh, at the hotel in Mumbai uh, in which several people lost their lives. Um, we must, as an international community, redouble our efforts to rid the world of international terrorism. Uh, uh, no one, no one can deny that terrorism is destructive. Uh, it undermines everything we try to do in the United Nations. The United Nations prioritizes development, prioritizes human rights, prioritizes the welfare and well-being of people. And terrorism sets out as an objective to instill fear in the hearts of people by killing people. That is not in keeping with the values and the, and the, and the ideals of the United Nations. India has been engaging with everybody around the world in order to curb this global menace. It has urged everybody to be on the same page when it comes to combating a common enemy. Moreover, at the United Nations, India has always voiced concern over the spread of terrorism and asserted that those countries that provide shelter to terrorists should be called out and held accountable for their deeds. Moving on. In Afghanistan, the Taliban's draconian restrictions have plunged the nation into darkness, particularly affecting the rights and opportunities of Afghan women. With millions denied access to education, tens of thousands stripped of employment and the suppression of women's businesses and activism, the hardline regime has regressed Afghan society, pushing women back into the shadows of oppression. A report. The Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan in August 2021 marked a significant decline in the nation's human rights landscape. The de facto rulers imposed harsh restrictions on freedom of expression and assembly, using violence to suppress dissent. However, one of the most alarming consequences of their rule has been the devastating impact on women and girls. Many girls were forced out of school and now face early marriages. Women lost jobs and are now struggling to support their families. Some were attacked for opposing the Taliban and forced to flee. According to a recent United Nations report, the Taliban are restricting Afghan women's access to work, travel and health care if they are unmarried or don't have a male guardian. In one incident, officials from the Vice and Virtue Ministry advised a woman to get married if she wanted to keep her job at a healthcare facility, saying it was inappropriate for an unwed woman to work, it said. Furthermore, the Taliban have barred women from most areas of public life and stopped girls from going to school beyond the sixth grade as part of harsh measures they imposed after taking power in 2021 despite initially promising more moderate rule. Recently, on the International Day of Education, UN Special Envoy to Afghanistan, Rosa Otunbayeva highlighted the ongoing denial of education for girls in Afghanistan and urged the de facto authorities to access of education for all. She called on the Taliban to recognize that education is not just a moral imperative but critical for prosperity and peace. The ongoing denial of education for all women and girls, it is not sustainable. As each day passes, 
the foundation of prosperous and equitable society is weakened. To the women and girls of Afghanistan, please know that you are not alone. The United Nations stands with you in solidarity and will not cease to engage and advocate for your future. This is not just a demand of Western nations, but also of the Muslim world. As recently, we've been at the conference where this presented by the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Afghanistan's de facto authorities have profound duty to protect and promote these rights for every individual, regardless of gender. To maintain the current path is to only inflict further harm on all Afghans and to leave Afghanistan isolated, both from the Islamic world and the international community. I therefore urge de facto authorities to recognize that education is not just a moral imperative, but critical for prosperity and peace. The Taliban's return and the dissolution of the previous republic on August 15, 2021 rolled back progress in protecting human rights and free society values. This particularly affected women and vulnerable groups, sparking serious concerns about the current human rights situation. Over the past two decades, Afghanistan made significant strides in human rights, democracy, gender equality, education, healthcare, and inclusivity. It served as a regional example with the thriving media landscape and open discourse. However, since August 15, 2021, uncertainty has prevailed, raising fears of human rights violations for activists, former government employees, women, and minorities. Talibani rulers have severely restricted human rights in the war-torn country. Institutions designed to support human rights have been severely limited or shut down completely. Moreover, the de facto rulers of the country have ordered the judges to impose Sharia law. Public executions and floggings are being reported in the country. Under the Taliban, extrajudicial executions are widespread, targeting former government associates, armed group members, and those not following Taliban rules. In December 2023, Rosa Otunbayeva briefed the UN Security Council on the situation in Afghanistan, saying that the human rights situation in Afghanistan today is a record of systemic discrimination against women and girls, repression of political dissent and free speech. Afghanistan was an original signatory to this declaration. But the key features of the human rights situation in Afghanistan today are a record of systematic, systemic discrimination against women and girls, repression of political dissent and free speech, lack of meaningful representation of minorities, and ongoing instances of extrajudicial killing, arbitrary arrests and detentions, torture, and ill treatment. Despite the recent release of two women activists, number of human rights defenders and media workers continue to be arbitrarily detained. The lack of progress in resolving human rights issues is a key factor behind the current impasse. Afghanistan faces grave difficulties with de facto rulers ignoring world leaders' demands and instead blaming the West for the country's challenges. The Taliban rulers refuse to acknowledge that a more moderate ideology could have led to a better situation in Afghanistan. A large number of Tibetan Uyghur activists on January 23rd organized a protest against the human rights violations being committed by China. The protest was held at Broken Chair in front of United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva. In the name of China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, 
security establishment in China has increased interference in the Xinjiang province. On the other hand, Islamabad-Beijing friendship is exploiting the natural resources in Pakistan's Balochistan province. Pakistan is turning Gwadar and other coastal areas of Balochistan into a Chinese stronghold. A report. A large number of Tibetan and Uyghur activists organized a protest against China outside the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva on January 23rd. The protests occurred during the 45th session of the Universal Periodic Review at the United Nations. The protesters were carrying banners reading Decolonize Tibet, China out of Tibet and Shame on China. A poster exhibition was also held to highlight human rights violations in Tibet and Xinjiang. It is a good step, I believe, because 2018 Three Circle only 14 countries raised the Uyghur issue. But this time more than uh, 31 countries. But 2018, there is no big evidence, you know, nobody know because China had successfully hiding this reality. But after that, the last five, six years, so many leaked documents was published, a lot of media documents was published, come survivor made testimony, a lot of international scholar, independent scholar made statement, and also UN High Commissioner report was released. In the situation, only 30 countries speaking out, another 130, more than 130 country, and they close the eyes, blind eyes, and don't speak out. Even some of them is to give high price to the Chinese government on the name developed. So it is mean China very successfully doing it is disinformation campaign around the world and uh, use it as economic power develop, develop, uh, 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 and the economic power and diplomatic power uh, trying to hide it is crime. During China's third UPR in November 2018, Beijing received 346 recommendations from 150 countries and accepted 284 of them with many questionably noted as accepted and already implemented. Despite a seemingly high acceptance rate, China broadly rejected recommendations on the rights of Uyghurs and Tibetans. Beijing rejected cooperation with the UN and restricted UN access to all regions of the country. Since 2018, mounting human rights abuses have been largely documented by a range of UN human rights bodies. Uyghurs and Tibetans are, is not just a regional concern, but a global echo calling for justice, dignity, respect and for human rights. In conclusion, as we stand together here today, at this critical juncture, let us remember that the universal periodic review is more than a diplomatic engagement. It is a moral obligation. We are entrusted with the responsibility to uphold the principles of human rights, to advocate for the silence and to ensure that no individual or community is left behind. Let this UPR be a testament to our unwavering commitment to these ideals. Human rights groups believe China has detained more than 1 million Uyghurs against their will over the past few years in a large network of what the state calls re-education camps and sentenced hundreds of thousands to prison terms. Moreover, on the name of China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, security agencies and the army establishment have increased interference in the matters of civilian administration in Xinjiang. Park China Coalition is exploiting people living on the both sides of the border. Pakistan is turning Gwadar and many other coastal areas of Balochistan into a Chinese stronghold that has the largest concentration of military cantonments and bases in the region. International observers say that it is the Chinese influencing the security policies of Pakistan in the region. 
they have been instructing Islamabad to get rid of the local people in the Gwadar region where the multi-billion flagship project CPEC culminates. Pakistan, which is already under massive Chinese debts, has no option but to follow commands. Amidst the burgeoning peace and development in Jammu and Kashmir post the abrogation of Article 370, a shadow of instability looms large due to Pakistan's persistent efforts to stoke unrest and foment terrorism across the Indian border. However, Indian security forces are leaving no stone unturned in pursuit of the ongoing crackdown on terrorism. In the most recent developments, the Indian Army launched Operation Sarvashakti to combat the escalating threat of cross-border terrorism, reaffirming the nation's unwavering resolve to safeguard peace and security in the strategically vital territory. Jammu and Kashmir is reaping peace dividends since after the abrogation of Article 370 and Article 35A in August 2019. The Union Territory has witnessed a surge in development, becoming a magnet for investors, eyeing opportunities in tourism, hospitality, retail and manufacturing. However, amidst this positive transformation, a shadow of instability looms over the region due to the divergent interests of neighbouring Pakistan. The development in Jammu and Kashmir runs counter to Pakistan's agenda and it helps terrorists to infiltrate and foment unrest within the Union territory. Director General of Police R.R. Swan, speaking on the sidelines of a public grievances redressal program in Avantipura, acknowledges the persistent challenge of cross-border infiltration. Despite this, he reassures that the security situation remains under control. security control में है और आपने जैसे देखा कि हम सबसे बड़ा security की सबसे बड़ा feature जो है वो एक law and order की और एक सड़क के ऊपर दुकानों में स्कूलों में businesses में एक order उसको लेकर जो challenge है वो हमने हम समझते हैं कि उस उस पर हमने अच्छी तरीके से काबू पाया है। अब दो चार टेररिस्ट्स बाहर से आकर ये एक नया चैलेंज हमारे लिए जरूर बना है कि बाहर से लोग इन्फिल्ट्रेट करके चोरी छिपे आके यहाँ पे कुछ चंद लोगों के साथ मिलकर in response to the escalating threat, the Indian Army takes a decisive step by launching Operation Sarva Shakti. This operation aims to neutralize terrorists operating on both sides of the Peer Panjal mountain ranges in the Union Territory. The strategic move is prompted by recent attempts by Pakistani proxy terrorist groups to revive terrorism in the south of Peer Panjal ranges, particularly in the Rajori Punch sector. Incidents like the attack on December 21, which claimed the lives of four soldiers in the Deiraki Gali area, underscore the urgency of the situation. Operation Sarv Shakti draws inspiration from the successful Operation Sarp Vinash initiated in 2003 to eliminate terrorists from the same areas in the south of Peer Panjal range. Army Chief General Manoj Pandey acknowledges the significant reduction in terrorist activities since 2003, but warns of renewed efforts by the Western adversary to revive terrorism in the region. The meticulous planning and execution of Operation Sarva Shakti are evident as it unfolds under the close monitoring of the Army Headquarters and the Northern Army Command in Udhampur. The operation was set into motion following a high-level security meeting chaired by Home Minister Amit Shah, which included key stakeholders such as National Security Advisor Ajit Doval, Army officials and representatives from intelligence agencies. To fortify the defence, 
The Indian Army has initiated the induction process of additional troops in the Rajouri Punch sector. Simultaneously, efforts to strengthen the intelligence setup in the region are underway, emphasizing the commitment to thwart any attempts by Pakistan to disrupt peace in India. Operation Sarf Shakti has been conceived to ensure the complete wiping out of the terrorists who are operating on the Pir Panchal ranges, especially on the Rajouri Punj sector side. Now, this is being launched from both the ends, that is the uh, Srinagar based core and the Nagrota based core. Both of them are going to coordinate and it's being coordinated by the Northern Command uh, Commander. Now, since Operation All Out started and then after that a complete wipeout of these terrorists was taken, was done in the Kashmir Valley, these uh, boys did not, uh, these terrorists rather, their terrorists did not go back to the valley, they stayed put here only. Now, to prevent when this operation, in this operation that these terrorists again cross over to the other side that is the Kashmir Valley, this operation is being launched from both the ends so that it is a pincer movement for them for uh, getting these terrorists and it will ensure that all these terrorists who are hiding in these uh, mountains over there in the uh, south and the, the north of Pir Panchal, they will be eliminated totally. Despite internal challenges including economic difficulties, Pakistan persists in its covert endeavors to fuel terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir. In contrast, India stands firm with a well-structured framework to counteract such threats, ensuring the tranquility of the region remains safeguarded. As the Indian Army embarks on Operation Sarva Shakti, the nation remains resolute in its pursuit of lasting peace and security in the strategically significant Jammu and Kashmir. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa.nin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.